Hello, welcome to the the inaugural episode of Something Rotten, a Max Payne 3 retrospective. Now, if you're listening to this, of course, you are likely on the Game Query feed. Uh, and if you're familiar with that specific corner of the internet, you know that this is a, a common talking point for the Game Query host, my, myself specifically. Uh, but also possibly a, a something long in the making. I, I can't believe it took us this long to do something Max Payne related. But joining me is my co-host, not AJ, not Leo, certainly not Haley. Jacob Geller is here. The Fourth unofficial host of Game Query. That's right. The, I'm the, here. <laughs> for the yeah, that's right. We did kick Leo out. I forgot in the canon, Leo is gone and replaced by Jacob. Uh, so here's the sales pitch for this. Jacob and me were like, let's do something Max Payne related. It sounded great. Originally, we were just going to stream the game, and then we said, what if we tripled that workload by <laughs> playing the game? maybe streaming it, and creating a whole mini-series book club podcast around it. Jacob, does that sound right to you? That sounds right, but the important thing is it was for charity. So That's true, that's we true. Did, uh, we did meet a donation threshold, and that is part of the reason why we're doing this. But honestly, it might have happened anyway, because both you and I have the disease where we just can't stop talking about Max <laughs> Payne 3 ever. So this is uh, therapy, maybe? <laughs> yeah, you know, what's, I was thinking about this while playing the first three chapters, which is what this episode is going to cover, chapter one, two, and three. So uh, like I said, this is set up like a book club. So if you want to play the game along with us, pause it now play chapters one two and three it takes like maybe two hours at the most like if you're taking your time um but while i was playing through them the thing i was thinking to myself now rockstar of course has put out um a lot of games that run an interesting gamut of qualities and narrative i would say like um what's the word i'm looking for Ambition. Rockstar games run the kind of gamut of qualities and ambition, but I was kind of wonder if Max Payne 3, and maybe this is something we'll have to touch on throughout the series, is Rockstar's most interesting game. Even compared to something like Red Dead Redemption 2, which while I think is great, is pretty cut and dry for what you would expect narratively from a Rockstar Western. But Max Payne 3 feels like this weird curveball in their library. Not too dissimilar from L.A. Noir. It, it kind of feels like uh, alternate universe rock star. You know, in, mm -hmm. in a world where, like, GTA did okay, but not great. And they were like, I guess we should make other genres. And so then, <laughs> and so then they became a studio that made kind of laser focused campaigns because max yeah. Payne 3 is entirely not open world and and yeah. fully fully linear um and yeah i think i am curious if you played this with no context if you would know that it was if you would be like this feels like a rock star game you know if you would be able to call that because they're definitely studio hallmarks there but yeah. also it's so different than especially their modern output um that yeah who knows i think for me it would stand out as a rock star game had i played it with no context just because the trademarks are so in your face here i mean there's some obvious things like rock stars i i I don't know. I'm using this phrase here, but they're like mechanic incubation they do uh, where something will show up in one game and be refined for a later game or used in a later game here. This is Rockstar as a developer's first use of bullet of uh, bullet time, which, of course, is a staple of the Max Payne series, but then will later show back up um, in GTA 5 with Michael. He would have that same mechanic. Mm -hmm. So you can see them kind of carrying things over from previous games into this one like yeah, a lot I mean, of the gunplay if you could recognize physics systems then <laughs> yeah. like all of max Payne 3 is like a like a ragdoll test for gta 5 
Um, but e- even like the movement and gunplay for better and worse is definitely very Rockstar. It feels like playing Grand Theft Auto 4 in that it's hard to play at times uh, mm-hmm. and very clunky. But I think the biggest standout here for me to get to your question about whether or not I w- could play this game and not know it's a Rockstar game without context is it has Rockstar's specific and unique brand of nihilism that makes it like immediately identifiable as like, yep, this is Dan Hauser and his crew of three or four other writers just fucking hating everything. Yeah, well, this is this is interesting, and we'll we'll talk about this throughout the series, I'm sure. But I will put out there right from the beginning that like I am not a GTA guy. Like I mm. I enjoy Red Dead Redemption, and I understand the value of of the gta series but like when i d- log on and see like oh fuckbook.com <laughs> haha i got them yeah. like i just hate that world and i hate living in it and max Payne 3 is not far off and so it's weird that i like this game so much and and i think i will be trying to figure out what exactly the line is between this and GTA, which are so aesthetically similar in so many ways that makes this work for me and GTA not. Well, I think, you know, what to, to shout out another uh, game uh, YouTuber here, Errant Signal. I recently watched his video on Grand Theft Auto V and he talked about some of the like, I think I'm thinking of the right person, but he talked about some of the like dissonances between the story no it was grand theft auto 4 apologies um the dissonances between the story rockstar was trying to tell and the world of grand theft auto where grand theft auto 4 is trying to tell this like very bleak immigration story about what it's like to come to america for an immigrant in search of this like you know ellis island american dream only to be met with like how america treats immigrants but around that is this like very crass unfunny south Mm park-esque like humor that the grand theft auto series is known for but max Payne 3 is more honed in on the bleakness you don't yeah this game doesn't max has a sense of humor but the game doesn't really like the world that he lives in is not a satirical world it is you know they want you to feel like this is as fucking gritty and real (laughs) as like anything and honestly to a level that almost becomes self-parodying in just how gritty it actually is Mm. i think maybe this will be a good place to transition to kind of where the max Payne games came from and why rockstar made three but that is in and of itself a little bit of a departure from max Payne one and two not in the sense that i think those games are satire but they're definitely homages and parodies of like classical noir and kind of hard-boiled crime dramas Mm -hmm. that this game also strips back like the max Payne one and two which remedy took out into later games had those um those tv shows you could watch were ba- which were basically like nypd blue or something you yeah. could watch in series it, it what i'm trying to say is it lost a lot of the camp yeah remedy has has always had that level of just kind of self-awareness in their games mm-hmm. where they know they're a little silly and they will like put nods in to their games being a little silly and yeah this this game takes itself so seriously in a way yeah. that both both the Remedy games and even kind of pulpy, noir like, you know, the things that they were drawing inspiration from didn't. Like, even those kind of dime store novels knew yeah. they were operating in a genre. <clears throat> and this game kind of feels like it... <laughs> it, it's unclear how self-aware it is about the tropes <laughs> that it's using. In that sense, it feels unique to Rockstar's catalog, at least at this time, but very indicative of a lot of the games that kind of began coming out around that time and are certainly still coming out, which aren't necessarily just prestige AAA games, but the self-serious almost like unaware that they're two self-serious games mm-hmm. like the last of us is a good example a game i like a lot but um 
you know, is kind of the same fucking angry daddy game that Max Payne 3 is. It, it, the vibe is kind of like, oh, you think video games are just games? Well, I'm going to show you how unfun we are, and then we'll be yeah. like a real story. Like, it's kind of... It it wants to be taken seriously so much that it just has like zero humor about itself. Yeah, uh, I think a good parallel to draw right here is God of War twenty eighteen or twenty seventeen or whatever mm -hmm. of a game that is uh, lacks the self awareness to know that it's maybe a little too serious. Like Kratos is serious in that game to the point that it's kind of hilarious in some cutscenes to watch him just sitting there brooding and like this game feels like it dances the line very well of uh, doing it well but not to the point where it's like tiresome like i like max's story yeah, well, even we, though it's we will I, I think we should start <laughs> let's start sure. talking about the game itself because I think I think there are parts where it succeeds and parts where it, it it's interesting you use the word tiresome because I definitely <laughs> think it it wanders into that territory mm. sometimes but it just just from like a like a personal level how did you first encounter this game like did you play it at release did you were you like excited mm. about it what's your kind of history with Max Payne 3 I don't remember if i play it had to have been close to release because i was still in high school when i played it mm -hmm. this game came out my senior year of high school um but i i don't remember a lot of i guess like excitement for the game i had to have been because i've been a fan of the max Payne series like literally since i was a kid my dad had a uh a bootleg copy of Max Payne 1 mm -hmm. that I would play the ever-loving shit out of as a child, but it had a parental lock on it where you could play the game, I think, with no blood, but none of the story would be there, so you couldn't watch any of the cutscenes, so it was, like, years later that I would see all the comic <laughs> things. Um, but, yeah, I don't remember a ton about playing it for the first time other than liking it a lot except for uh the mission and the office which we'll get to in later episodes Ooh, i guess interesting yeah, yeah because i i i ask kind of because like i didn't know anything about this game or oh, this, this series at all i'm i'm trying to um i'm looking on steam to see when i got like my first achievement in it or something mm -hmm. um because like I, I just, I had kind of like, I, so I got it in July 18th, 2013. When did this game come out? Uh, 2012. Okay, so I got it only like a year after it came out, but it was just, mm -hmm. for me, it was like, I had just built a new computer, like that was my first gaming PC year, and I was just kind of like, I want something that, that looks really good, that like I didn't have on console, and probably has better graphics than my PS3 could handle. <laughs> yeah. And and Max Payne 3 was like on sale and so I just got it. And and I like didn't I knew that it was a slow-mo shooting series and I think I had actually seen the Mark Wahlberg movie before <laughs> this having like literally zero context of the character. Um but yeah. I came in pretty blind like didn't didn't know the series didn't really know um you know what rockstar was doing with it just thought it seemed like a good looking shooter game that i wanted to try out so you hadn't played one or two no have you since played them i i have like watched playthroughs of them so mm. i'm i'm aware of them uh but i haven't actually like hands on the controller played them Max Payne 1 is pretty hard to go back to. Uh, Max Payne 2, I feel like, gets a bad rap, but it is definitely maybe the standout of the series for me. I don't know if it was when I played it at, like, that point in my life makes it stand out. No, but, I think, like, I mean, it still has a pretty good critical reception. I mean, like, Racevic, mm -hmm. who's, like, a big YouTuber gamer guy, has mm -hmm. a video on Max Payne 2 talking about how good it is. Like, I think it yeah. it's it definitely has kind of a cult status but people still really like that game just so this can still stand amongst other game query podcasts i am going to say perhaps my nostalgic for my nostalgia for max Payne 2 comes from the fact i had learned from x play thank you very much adam and morgan uh of the mona sax nude mod which i exclusively play that game uh with 
I remember this very <laughs> <Good> vividly. <Lord. laughs> but Were anyway, you disappointed I, <laughs> that that wasn't in Max Payne 3? <laughs> I'm just disappointed Mona Sachs isn't in Max Payne 3 <laughs> at all. But it is interesting that Max Payne 3, it, like, to use the phrase again, dances the line between being a sequel and a reboot very well. I guess it's another parallel to draw between God of War uh, 2018. Is that when that game came out? 2018? Yeah. Um, where it's like at the same time God of War 4, but also God of War, you know, New God mm-hmm. of War with the umlaut over the U. Max Payne 3 feels the same way. Yeah, um, that in the I, beginning, it kind of, <clears throat> like, there's there's that opening montage where it shows him doing stuff. And, like, honestly, the only thing you know need to know about his history for this game is wife and kid are dead. Like, that's yeah. the only thing that matters about him. And it shows him, like, kneeling at the grave uh of his wife and kid with flowers and you're like guess this dude has a dead wife and kid that's it like that is the only kind of important part of his character (laughs) exactly and i think lowering that barrier ends up working for max Payne 3 but i think it also means that a lot of people probably have only played max Payne 3 Mm -hmm. and not one and two which are definitely harder to go back to than three sometimes harder to get a hold of unless you have like a ps2 and a copy of that or or i guess if you have a pc they're probably pretty easy but if you don't have a pc they're pretty hard to get and then wrap your mind around the old controls so i guess for anyone who isn't like familiar with the series beyond max Payne three like they have a pretty deep history both in what they mean for remedy entertainment and kind of like how rockstar getting got involved with it so i i did some preliminary research um this game was developed by rockstar vancouver which no longer exists which maybe we'll have to get into in a later episode but they were actually shut down the same year this game came out they were like Hmm. folded into some of the other rockstar studios as rockstar had like quite a few i think restructurings of their studios in the late 2000s Mm -hmm. but rockstar vancouver it used to be and please stop me at any point if you want to talk about some of this stuff because i think it is interesting but um rockstar vancouver used to be barking dog studio which only had worked on two games before being purchased by rockstar one was counter-strike but specifically it's beta 5 version update and the other was the homeworld series for sierra entertainment but then it was purchased in 2002 by rockstar for three million dollars which uh is a low amount it sounds like (laughs) for a studio um but also like really early into rockstar's history until you kind of think about what rockstar was up to at that time which in the early 2000s, kind of throughout the maybe mid-2000s, Rockstar was buying a lot of studios. This is like coming off the tail of GTA 3 and Vice City and San Andreas. Mm -hmm. And Rockstar was becoming the biggest fucking shit in the world, which they obviously still are, like almost (laughs) 20 years later. Barking Dog was only the third studio Rockstar purchased. The first was DMA Design, which it bought really early on, which is Rockstar North now which made uh, the Grand Theft Auto series Manhunt um, and basically is like Rockstar's oh, now I one of two. I forgot about Manhunt, dude. Manhunt is yeah. actually, that is that is an interesting point of comparison for here. You keep, yeah. keep going with the production, mm-hmm. but like if you want a game that, talking about Rockstar games that like take themselves as seriously as one possibly could <laughs> like yeah that that's an interesting kind of touch point i i was thinking about manhunt while playing through the first three chapters mm-hmm. today but um i bring all this up like so rockstar had bought dma designs which did it's basically now rockstar's primary studio along with san diego mm-hmm. um and they had rockstar toronto at the time which i'm not super familiar with their history And then this was the third one they purchased. And then a couple months later, they bought San Diego, which is like their other North. It's like Rockstar North is the GTA studio. San Diego is the Red Dead studio. Mm -hmm. And then they all kind of work on the same thing. Um, I bring this up because Rockstar buying all these studios on the one hand was just a trend of Rockstar at the time. When I spoke to one of the co-founders, Jamie King, a few years ago about buying San Diego, he said that when collaborating with a third-party developer on a series doing well 
and he was ta- he was talking specifically about San Diego to be clear. Buying that studio helps build up a franchise, so it scales headcount and grows profit. Um, that said, I don't really know why they bought Barking Dog. Yeah, well, they it had clearly wasn't with- like we want these guys to make Max Payne because they didn't yeah. do that for ten years. And they had no prior history with <laughs> yeah. Rockstar, which is interesting because San Diego had done Midnight Club, Smuggler's Run. They had published Red Dead Revolver, uh, Mad Doc, which was uh, became Rockstar New England, had done Bully Scholarship Edition before being purchased DMA. Anyway, there's obviously a reason. I just couldn't figure it out why. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I bring all this up because it's going to help you understand how Max Payne 3 was made later on and maybe why it was so troubled. But anyway, they purchased Rockstar Vancouver and the first game they were supposed to make was uh, a Spec Ops game for PlayStation 2 that was canceled. I don't know why. But a weird fact about that is Josh Holm was from Queens of the Stone Age and his collaborator, Alan Johannes, who I'm not super familiar with, uh, was supposed to score that game. Uh, so mm. Vancouver went on and made Bully, which came out in October 2006. You know, actually, really- hold on. I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. Being scored by, like, oh, interesting pre-existing band, they did stick with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, was, if that was a studio staple, they did <laughs> if you that. dig, if you dig through Rockstar, they uh, they kind of haven't changed their approach to games basically since the inception of that studio, <laughs> and that's just one of many examples. Work your player, uh, another, work your developers to death, and then yeah. make uh, billions of dollars. It's a successful and, strategy, and make games that aren't always very fun to play. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> But anyway, so they put out Bully, which is like this huge cult hit, um, and they kind of they're gonna go silent in the story for a little while. So Max Payne one and two were developed by Remedy, who went on to do Quantum Break and Alan Wake, and most recently Control. And the the way Max Payne three comes out as a Rockstar game is this was only Remedy's second game, which to get into their history, kind of, like, laid the foundation for its later mm-hmm. games, which are, like, story-driven worlds where, like, the world is just as much of a character. If you think of Max Payne 1 and 2, like, New York feels kind of like a oh, character totally. as much yeah. as Max does. And, and I and mean, then, just even even the weird, like, watching TV shows thing yeah, has, like... Exactly. It, it's interesting that that has been in that studio's DNA from, like, mm-hmm. day one. Also, like... um first person dialogue for the character yeah, like a and, lot of the character like just even, thinking even using live action you know yeah, that, that like exactly max Payne one infamously has like sam lake's face just like copy pasted <laughs> yeah. onto the character yeah it's funny that they ran with that because originally as far as i understand maybe i'm assuming here but a lot of that like for uh like real world FMV or I guess at the time it was just photographs was probably due to like technical limitations and they've kind of just kept it going. I mean, it's like, it's uh, not like they were even hiring actors. It was just like, who works here? Well, I'm saying like, but in control, you know, it comes back again. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to. I mean, quantum break is a fucking TV show. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So to uh, its detriment, but it is there. I like Quantum Break a lot. It gets bad rap, though. <laughs> uh, so that game came out in July 2001, and it was published by Gathering of Developers. It came out in July 2001 on PC, I should say. Published by Gathering of Developers, which is this weird publisher people should look up. Uh, Gathering of Developers, also called God Games, which maybe tells you everything you need to know about <laughs> that publisher, who did, like, Serious Sam games. They published the infamous Guy game, which is a great story in and of itself. <laughs> and the first Mafia Not a great game, game but a great story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first Mafia game. And God has kind of been forgotten these days. But uh, one of the founders is Mike Wilson, who was like one of the early marketing people for id. Hmm. He He's written about in Masters of Doom. So it's interesting to see his like early history there. And then uh, he also helped found Devolver Digital, which is, you know, very well known in the game industry today. But God is kind of like the proto Devolver in That's a lot of ways. Not in the sense that like, God Games was this scrappy upstart indie publisher, but a lot of their like publicity moves are very similar, and it's mm-hmm. interesting to see Mike Wilson was doing that like 15 years ago. They announced um, that E3 was canceled before anyone else did. <laughs> no, but Devolver's um, 
willingness to not attend E3, but to hang out in the parking lot across the street. Uh, that is something, if I remember correctly, uh, that God Games did. They oh, would just, funny. like, throw barbecues outside E3. <laughs> uh, but the, the console port... And the GBA port, which exists, of Max Payne 1. Which you should look up because, oh man. Yeah, was published by Rockstar, who now Rockstar is known as this company that is this like very prestigious developer who makes Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead, and that's fucking it. Uh, but they, like, a lot of their early history is they just, I, I mean, not to like be reductive, but they were a publisher of a lot of fucking shovelware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, they would kind of, again, to Jamie King, when I talked to him about Red Dead, he called it a relentless rate in which they would put games out. They were publishing like Austin Powers games and like this like state of emergency and all of these fucking weirdo games that no one remembers. Um, and then on top of that, they were putting out the Grand Theft Auto series. Mm -hmm. So, Without any inside knowledge of why they published Max Payne, it stands to reason it was probably just a deal they made. Right. Who knows if they saw it as something they would try to make a flagship series later on, but it was just another one of the fucking... It, if you go to their Wikipedia and just look at the games they put out for the first 10 years of their existence, it's insane. It mm -hmm. has to be something like 40 games or some shit that they were just publishing for partners and all this stuff. Anyway, uh, take two... Ended up, I, I God it closed at some point. They're not super important to the story, uh, but Take Two, and which is Rockstar's parent company, bought the Max Payne license. Max Payne Two came out, and then Remedy went on to do its own thing. And this is where uh, Max Payne Three actually comes into play. So s rumors of Max Payne Three's existence started in like 2008. Strauss Zelnick kind of said in an investor's call or something, Strauss Zelnick being uh, the head of Take-Two, kind of said in an investor's call, like, oh, we're doing it, and people just kind of ran from... But actually, I don't see this talked about a lot. Max Payne 3 was announced in 2004, a year huh. after Max Payne 2. And it's super weird. I only saw, like, one or two stories about it. But basically, take Two CEO at the time Jeffrey L. LePin, who left only a couple months after this happened, informally announced the game in 2004. I was like, yeah, we're doing it. It's happening. Because Max Payne 2 had not been successful. It mm. did not do super well commercially. I'm not exactly sure uh, critically at the time. But it was kind of looked like looked at as kind of a disappointment, especially compared to Max Payne 1, which sold better and generally just has stuck around more than Max Payne 2. Right, and also, I mean, one had, like, a micro-budget, and so presumably yeah. two cost a lot more to make, and so for it to yeah. not meet the same sales would be, like, a big, big hit. Yeah, so, but only a year after that, the CEO of Take-Two Interactive, which owns Rockstar, was like, yeah, we're gonna do another game, and then there are funny quotes you can find on the internet from both Rockstar and Remedy. Because Rockstar published Max Payne 2, was the sole publisher, mm -hmm. I should say. God was out of the picture. Uh, Remedy and Rockstar were like, we have no clue what they're talking <laughs> about. They're like, we're not making it. We don't know who's making it. Um, so anyway, yeah, the game was announced in 2004, but basically didn't resurface until 2008 when Strauss Zelnick was like, yeah, it's happening. And then it was formally announced in 2009. Um, the rumors had been floating around for about a year. The game was formally announced in March 2009 and was set for a winter 2009 release. Now, if you are familiar at all with Max Payne 3, <laughs> you know they missed that. It's like they didn't so much miss the basket. They shot the basketball into the next count. They really, they they really last guardian it. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they, they Final Fantasy 13 that shit. <laughs> If you ask me, with no insider information, I think that release date was always bullshit, but I think a lot of release dates are always right. bullshit. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the game entered development, but I doubt it was too long af before this. Like, I would assume probably 07, 08. Yeah, they, they had, but, like, a storyboard, and they were like, yeah, we'll yeah. release it next year. <laughs> and that storyboard was probably thrown away multiple times, oh, yeah. as we'll get into. Yeah, I think I think you can the game has that energy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 
I, I don't have like definitive reasons for why Remedy did not develop this other than they were making Alan Wake at the time. So maybe they just and they didn't own the series by any means. So it's not like Rockstar had to let them develop it. But Remedy was off making Alan Wake. So Rockstar Vancouver made Max Payne 3. And again, it's not something I'm exactly clear on why, because Max Payne 3, at least according to Vancouver's. Vancouver's Wikipedia page is only the fourth game they ever made, which feels wild to me Mm -hmm. that Rockstar, without any knowledge of it, without me having any knowledge of it, was just like, let's let them tackle this huge, massive project, which is probably why. Do you have any idea what the budget was for this game? I saw rumors earlier today, but I didn't feel like they were trustworthy but it was like a hundred million or something yeah, like this, that, that I, um, saw. I just googled and on some b- bullshit you know uh, top 10 list yeah. it says that it was a uh, 105 million dollars uh which was quite expensive for the time and now but especially i mean yeah. like yeah game game budgets have ballooned as of recently and so there are more games that cost a hundred million dollars but like i remember yeah. hearing that GTA 4 cost $100 million with, like, hushed tones. Like, can mm. you believe they made a game that cost this much? Yeah, and I think Red Dead cost $250 million mm-hmm. was the story that came out from that uh, New York Magazine article. Uh, I don't know why Vancouver was pegged to develop it. Rockstar operates in a weird way where some outside of, or they did at the time, where Grand Theft Auto, and uh, other than Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead, series aren't beholden to being headed by a specific studio so rockstar vancouver made bully but you know according to a few of the stories that have come out bully 2 was in development at rockstar new england so it's like a specific rockstar studio at the time it doesn't seem like they you know they got to hold their Mm -hmm. (laughs) cards close to their chest and so speculation is rockstar vancouver just didn't have a project in 2007 2008 after bully came out other than like scholarship edition and probably some support they might have been doing on like gta 4 and some other games so they probably were just open so rockstar was like here's the project anyway announced in 2009 uh this fucking game was delayed no less than three times but possibly four or five times at least that we heard about and That is, I know I'm running long in the tooth here, listener, but that is assumably because the game's development was very troubled. And I pulled this from Engadget, which I think is maybe the most enlightening piece of information I found about why Max Payne 3 took so long to come out and had so many delays. So they talked to a source who was anonymous um, and said virtually everything said in the original Rockstar Wives letter and by current and former Rockstar San Diego employees in the comments, applies to my experience at Rockstar Vancouver. For background, Rockstar Wives letter is a letter um, that was supposedly written by the wives of Rockstar San Diego developers talking about the extreme and brutal working conditions. on. Yeah, basically, like, one. I haven't seen my significant other in months. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what are you doing to them? When that story came out, there were a bunch of stories that also came out at that time about basically every other Rockstar studio being like, yeah, it's not just San Diego. It's hell at all these studios. Also, it it Um, should be just just pointing out, it's like the the difference in climate when that letter came out, you know, just just even the framing as Rockstar Wives letter, although I think they called it that themselves you know, was, like, a pretty sexist framing, and I feel like a lot of (laughs) the outlet's coverage of it was, like, oh, look at, look at these wives complaining that they can't see their husbands or whatever, when what it really was, was, like, a letter pointing out widespread labor exploitation, (laughs) but, yeah, but, but it wasn't, like, at least my memory of it wasn't, like, oh my god, this is horrible, it was, like, it's kind of funny that, all these women wrote a letter about how they can't see their husband. <laughs> like sure. that's that's how it was covered, and that is not how it should have been covered. Sure, yeah, but to on the other side, a lot of other stories did come out about what yes. it was like working mm-hmm. at Rockstar Studios. Though it is interesting to think about where the game press was at that time. That when all the Red Dead Two stories started coming out, 
about the issues with crunch on that um it seemed like a lot of people had forgotten that the entire that this exact same conversation happened 10 years before yeah (laughs) um launched by red dead one uh ironically or coincidentally enough but uh Engadget's source said this came after, I think, the first or second delay to, like, August 2010 or something. That source was not optimistic that they would hit that because the story, and this is a quote, the game's story just went through another total rewrite earlier this month, the third that I am aware of in the past two years. And that means the team would have to have all of the content done by April or May to make that August release date, end quote. Um, and then in gadget writes further claims about the studio range from an enforced crunch mode through to the end of the project the results in 14 to 16 hour workday six or seven days a week to canceled two weeks of vacation over the past holidays to further that a couple of years ago or maybe last year kotaku and a big report they had about uh what crunch is like across all rockstar studios i think they interviewed like a hundred or so people something fucking insane like that um Kotaku said people who worked on Max Payne 3 have described it as a death march, a brutal period of time for the company that involved long nights and plenty of mandatory crunch. And this is a quote from one developer at Rockstar's New England office. Uh, I'm going to be honest, a lot of the details of my life during that time are pretty blank. It was getting, it was a lot of getting into the office at 9 or 10 a.m. and leaving at 10 or 11 at night. And let's see, that person who was salaried did not get paid for their extra hours. Instead, they had to hope for... Hope that the game would sell well enough to net everyone on staff a healthy bonus. I hope that and their then, game wasn't helmed by Randy Pitchford. <laughs> Is that the, right? Know? Right. Well, Rockstar also has had issues in the past right. with people getting bonuses. Um, and even myself, in reporting other stories, have heard that Max Payne 3's development was fucking brutal. Uh, Rockstar, obviously, as we've established known for its crunchy development. One developer I talked to said Max Payne 3 was not only the worst crunch he had encountered at Rockstar, the worst crunch he had ever encountered in his career entirely. So that seems like a very unanimous feeling on the various studios that work. Yeah, it's it's interesting that like because we're talking about this more, I feel like there's kind of, um, it's easy to feel like crunch is getting worse you know that like yeah. it's like we got this huge red dead redemption 2 story and so it's like god this must have been awful it's like no it's pretty par for the course like the only difference yeah. and and honestly like <clears throat> not not to give them too much credit but like better than it has been you know the only difference is like now we're asking questions about it um yeah but but like you know the same thing goes for naughty dog and the same thing goes for all these different studios is like this has mm-hmm. been in their culture forever and and yeah. yeah hearing hearing stuff about max Payne 3 has always been like it's like in retrospect it's like yeah no one really asked us about it at the time and it turned out <laughs> yeah. that game almost killed me yeah, and so I, I bring all that up just to give listeners a background just on where Max Payne came from, uh, but also to kind of set the stage, I think, for what Max Payne 3 ultimately released as in 2012, you know, four, three or four years after they thought they said the game was going to come out. Uh, because I think without that knowledge, it, you can appreciate or see what Max Payne 3 is a lot better by knowing the background of how ha- behind how it was made. Um, my last point on this is going to be where it sits in Rockstar's history. Like I, you know, established earlier Rockstar in the first decade or so of its history, just basically pumped fucking games out like it, an absurd amount of games, but you can pinpoint the moment it happened when GTA four released Rockstar pumped the brakes on its release schedule. It was still porting things, and it still does port games to anything that will run, except for Max Payne 3, weirdly (laughs) enough. Um, But in terms of new games it was putting out, once GTA 4 hit in 2008, it put out... It stopped putting out multiple new games a year. It kind of shifted to this one new game a year. So you got, like, GTA 4, and then L.A. Noir, and then Max Payne 3 in 2012... And it did that for like five or six years, maybe a couple years less. But 
And then in 2013, the year after this Grand Theft Auto came out, and it... Yeah, can you imagine if we still got one Rockstar game a year? <laughs> Nuts. Yeah, but it... Um, GTA 5 came out in 2013, and then it changed completely, and then it was another five years until Red Dead Redemption 2 came out. So that is the point where Rockstar became what we now know of as Rockstar, where their games, again, not including the ports, which they put out all the time, but the, it, the a new Rockstar game became an event, something that did not happen often. And they started to really push the budgets they were putting into these games, the technology they were putting into these games, like how many fucking stories came out about L.A. Noir's face, facial capture technology right. or whatever. Like they were supposed to be seen as this high art, adult focused, mature stories that were gritty and violent and for an audience beyond just the normal gamer or consumer. Like this was supposed to be shit you would watch after you watched your favorite Martin Scorsese film. Yeah, you put on your favorite Dan Houser Specifically game. films. Like, you know, that, that's yeah. always kind of been a thing, but it's like, it feels like the, the peak thing they want to be is like a classic movie you know that's that's yeah. kind of like rockstar's mo and if i can get a little bit masturbatory about this here like it is so interesting that max Payne 3 is like the game that exists on that line because it is like yeah. it is like fundamentally a game about like being a bitter old man being forced <laughs> to enter a new world you know that he's like not mm -hmm. used to and that represents like a complete shift from like who he's been in the past it's like yeah it, it's hard to think of something that would be more tonally fitting for this weird period of transition for them than max mm -hmm. Payne 3 yeah um i think that's a good place to i know i know that was a lot of a lot of talk but i think that's a good place to launch into max Payne 3 um, which is a very Max Payne three, every level in Max Payne three feels like the biggest set piece of another game of that time. Mm -hmm. Um, which is obviously a product of Rockstar, you know, pumping so much money into these games, being such perfectionists and wanting to go bigger than everyone else. Um, you get a game that and I'm going to hand the gulp, the, the torch to you on this, but you get a game that from the opening kind of draws a line in the sand about the kind of story it wants to tell and the level of action you're going to have to go through for it to tell that story. And it's a weird push and pull of intimacy in the story and absolute chaos yeah. in the gameplay. <laughs> totally. Um, um, yeah. One of the things that, I was reminded of playing through the first three chapters and we will actually start talking about the game yeah. proper now <clears throat> is this story asks a lot of you like very quickly is like it from the mm. from the very beginning introduces a lot of characters and and yeah. says like here are all these characters here are their relationships with each other remember this because this is going to be plot relevant and mm -hmm. and then and this is this is a very jacob gallery point <laughs> and, and you can you can say if you agree with this or not but i think part of the experience of playing this game especially the early levels is kind of not knowing what's going on in a similar yeah. way to max himself where he is this old drug addled dude who is is yeah. in the midst of alcoholism and and mm -hmm. is you know playing bodyguard to this rich family and and they're just it's like okay this is the the sister and this is his wife and this is you know their cousin or whatever and they're just throwing so many people and locations at you that it's very easy to lose track of like who is what going on yeah. And that feels a little like being a, a fucked up old guy trying to keep pace with this world he doesn't understand. So there's this thing the game does a lot uh, visually like where lot. it'll be kind of <laughs> where it's like this. I, I don't know the proper term from it for it, but the layman's way of explaining it is it looks like a flash of light. 
appears on screen and then everything's kind of out of focus. The You're having trouble seeing the colors. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the game does this a it's lot. It's kind of one way of describing it would be kind of glitchy. Another yeah. one would be saying it, it's kind of like it's like the colors get misaligned. You know, you'll see yeah. you'll see like three versions of Max kind of on top of each other, and it's like red mm-hmm. and green and blue in the in just kind of a normal normal kind of color wheel way. But it's yeah, it it, it feels like a their tone is very intentionally out of focus. It's like everything isn't solid here. It's disorienting. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, I think a good way to describe it. And for me, I guess we should establish this as early as possible, given one of the big point, the big <laughs> like narrative conceits of this game. I am a recovering alcoholic. Um, I have had to go to rehab and stop drinking, much like Max will have to do later in this game. Um, but those specific flashes always remind me of the panic of waking up from a bender. Where you don't know, you are completely disoriented on what happened, what is going on, where you are. This game is full of those moments. They come halfway through a scene where you think you know what's going on, but something about this visual cue just disorients you. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's a lot of crosstalk in this game. Like, it does a really good job of making you feel like you are either drunk and unsure what's going on, or understanding that Max probably just on a base level is hung over and feeling like shit but having to deal with all this visual and sonic information at once yeah and, and and the fact is the story is incredibly not chronological and mm-hmm. and the opening cutscene is really unclear like where that happens in the midst of the story and throughout yeah. that opening cutscene you are flashing to different points throughout the story including the very end of the game and Mm -hmm. and then and then you kind of go back and so yeah there's there's this feeling do you know it's the slaughterhouse five thing he's unstuck in time you know you're just kind of like phasing through all these scenarios and especially on a first playthrough you don't know what the fuck is going on like where where you are actually supposed to be from what perspective this is being told from it's all Mm -hmm. very hazy but it feels it feels appropriate because it feels like Max doesn't clearly know oh, who these absolutely. people are. Yes. Because, you know, if there's one thing, Dan Hauser's not the sole writer on this, but he is the primary writer. If there's one genre Dan Hauser likes, it's uh, mob and gangster movies. Mm-hmm. And something every gangster mob movie asks of its viewer is to understand the relationships and politics of the family to other families and other organizations. This game jumps headfirst into that in the like first or second cut scene where it's like, here's the Bronco family that Max has been hired to be a bodyguard of. Here's how they kind of operate in Sao Paulo. Here's kind of their, here's their brother. Here's what he does. Oh, there's this cop over here and this doctor here. Here's their relationship. Mm -hmm. So on top of you already feeling Max's drunken stupor, you're hearing, you know, the sounds of a party in one of the early scenes and also trying to wrap your mind around the relationship this family has with each other, but also the city they work in and the other people that work in the city that they're close to. And then, of course, on top of that, they throw in this fucking militia right (laughs) and then a paramilitary yeah and i think i think one of the one of the interesting things about the very first level of the game is when at least my feeling was like when you finally get to shooting stuff it's like oh god something that makes sense (laughs) in in this very because it's like while the story is is very complicated in this game the gameplay is almost unbelievably simple that it's it's like You got, you got a, just a dot as your reticule, and you click on dudes' heads and they die. Like that's yeah. that is basically the the thing. And and you've got your your slow motion and your set pieces, which we'll talk about. But like, it's it's interesting how it takes a long time for you to get into the first shooting thing, and there's not like a shooting range tutorial. It's not like okay, Max, mm. let's let's see if you remember how to use a pistol. It just kind of throws you in. And it's like all right, these dudes are attacking, kill them. And then you yeah. do that. 
And for me, that's always kind of a relief to get there because I feel like I'm so in over my head with all the characters and stuff, but I know how to kill people. <laughs> I, I think that comes down to two things. One, narratively, it makes sense that Max would be so... Max almost seems comforted by violence. Oh, totally, yeah. He's... He never seems to enjoy violence, but he understands Mm -hmm. it in a way that, like, there's... The second level takes place in a nightclub, and Max just visually looks out of his element. He's an old white guy. (laughs) He's an old white guy in a Brazilian nightclub, so just, like, on a base level that he looks out of his place. But also, like, he just doesn't want to be there so once the violence starts max is in his element but also to get back to kind of the simplicity of it just when the violence hits it's there just go shoot things and it also feels like rockstar's mo where like the the story is always first fiddle and the gameplay comes second Mm -hmm. where when i and this is not my first time playing the game by any means but even this time when i got control of max i was like one, where are the tutorials? But two, it's just like, oh, this is it. That's right. It's just a cover shooter. Yeah. You and, know, and there's like one or two interesting, cool slow-mo things it does. And and, and it's also like this game I, I remember getting criticism for, and I, I think this is a legit critique, is you cannot skip most of the cutscenes because I think they're, you know, disguised loading screens or whatever. But like... Yeah you have no choice but to watch the story for most of this game. You can't you can't make it a gameplay first game because you just have to spend so much time watching those cutscenes. It's like they make it very hard to ignore everything that's going on outside of the gameplay systems. Let me let me ask you, what do you think about, you know, having some knowledge of the first two games? What do you think about the shift in location? In Max Payne 3 to Sao Paulo, Brazil. It is... <laughs> I think we will talk about this as the series goes on. It is an interesting move to d- d- make a gangster movie in some place that we usually don't see gangster movies. Like, that's... Sure. You know, I and I think probably if you had to ask, like, one of the reasons why they did this, it would be, like... We wanted to just have a unique location because because we mm-hmm. know that gangster movies take place in New Jersey or whatever, which which this series mm-hmm. is kind of based in, and we do go yeah. back there eventually. But I think it's also yeah this this rock star thing of like really liking the contrast between like bright, sunny, beautiful, and incredibly violent. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's also the rock star thing of some pretty significant racial insensitivity, I would say. Which, yeah, is interesting because this game has aspirations of being a critique on capitalism and kind of wealth disparity. I mean, like, literally in the second cutscene, Max talks about how, like, you know, Americans know their capitalism. Yeah, but he can, but it's kind like, of saying it works, and so it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> right. But like, it's also like Max is making no bones about he hates the fucking rich people he mm-hmm. works for. You know, like Rockstar's kind of heavy-handed in that. But then at the same time, is undermining its own ostensible message here by basically sending white guy to brown country yeah, to you, kill this this game has a very clear color spectrum of who like mm-hmm. like even even though the the uh family you're protecting is also like you know brazilian or whatever they're like you know yeah. they're from that location they all of the thugs that you're killing are more brown than all of the mm-hmm. people you're protecting and that could be a another commentary on race, but I don't think the game makes it. You know, it feels like it's sure. just kind of easy coding for them of being like, how are we going to tell the kind of like hired thugs who it is your job to kill? And especially when you're in Sao Paulo, it's like, oh, you because they're darker. <laughs> like, because that's, that's who yeah. they are. And I mean... Yeah, look, this is not necessarily our conversation to have as two white guys, but Dan Hauser, I think, has not always been taken to task by some of his writing of P- 
people of uh, some of the way he's he's written people of color um, often as comic relief or idiot enemy foibles. I mean, he kind and of this he game, feels like he kind of has like a Tarantino thing. If you if you feel, if you think about how many times the N bombs have been dropped in he, other work. Dan Hauser has given himself the inward card <laughs> he, with his scripts. He sure has. Yes. Um, this game, though, I don't think it's a reaction to maybe any of those criticism that maybe have been levied at Dan Hauser, but it seems to want to say something about the rich and the rich's view of the poor. Right. But that doesn't make sense if most of your enemies are just the poor it's a you know? it, it's very close to a lot of interesting things and and yeah. which is which is the kind of the story of this game and some of them it does feel like it it really gets incisive on and some it feels mm. like it's just inches away but maybe doesn't quite um yeah it can't always decide who it's imp- who it wants you to empathize with and who it wants to vilify, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I, on paper, I do like the setup to Max Payne three story. Like I would have been just as happy to have another New York gritty cop story, right. but the idea of taking Max Payne out of like this very specific view of New York that largely exists because of gangster movies and Martin Scorsese movies where it's always snowy and nighttime mm-hmm. and there's drug addicts on the streets with guns and shit like all this very pulpy <clears throat> these pulpy views of that city removing Max who fits very well into that whole right. like archetype like of that, that is, city that is what his character is drawn around you know like the trench exactly, coat and yeah. the, the pistols and the what like he is made to be in that world exactly and pick like taking him out of that and dropping him into sunny brazil as this like gun for hire bodyguard basically is like an interesting setup mm-hmm. and a good way to take the one or two things it's carried from Max Payne 1 and 2 over to Max Payne 3 and tell the kind of more interesting... Th- there are two stories going on in this game. There's the story of the Broncos and there's the story of Max. And while those stories are often intertwined, they're largely separate. Mm-hmm. I think the location benefits Max's story, which ends up being the more interesting story. And then the Broncos... It's just another story that's happening at the same yeah. time. Um, uh, but yeah, but but getting back to let's 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 get back to because I do I do want to <laughs> like talk through the levels themselves. So the first level, you're you're kind of you're introduced to all the Broncos. Um, some dudes break in, seemingly with the the goal of like kidnapping some of the Broncos to just you know hold them for ransom or whatever, and so you start doing your Max Payne thing and just kind of gun through this really lavish man- mansion, you know, that that mm-hmm. they're in one of these kind of, like, houses on a hill where where you, in the very first scene, you kind of look down at all the slums mm-hmm. and, and then you're like, oh, we're up here and they're down here. Um, and you gun down uh, all these people in this mansion. You do a really cool thing where you... You kind of slide down a roof and shoot a dude who's holding someone, and then you fall into a pool, which is... It's very cool, and then repeated a bunch. You do, <laughs> yes. There are, almost every level has something like this, where it's a big slow motion set piece, where you're, all your job is to do is to shoot people, and while you're doing that, Max is doing something ridiculous. And yeah. then at the end, do you, you basically you know it's like they almost get away you shoot the tires off a truck and you kill everyone so this whole level is just kind of setting like this family is at risk you the reason you're here mm. is because they are desirable for for you know people to hold for ransom or try to hold up or do any number of things with 
it's under tutorialized in a way which is very interesting i only found out because someone was killing me that there were on-screen prompts telling you how to play i guess there are other ways to trigger that but the game basically just let me loose i had to look up how to do the cool jumping move mm-hmm. where i fly through uh slow motion the only time the game ever was like hey here's how you play is when a dude ran up on me and i was trying to find out how to kill him and they were like oh it'll go in slow motion if you're about to die and you can have a second to shoot mm-hmm. at. Yeah, but. so this this game, you know, the, the basic functions of, of the Max Payne universe are you can slow down time, which is on a meter, and so you have, you have like, a limited amount of time you can slow down, and you can also kind of dive through the air, and when you dive, time is automatically slowed down, and, and so you can avoid bullets and shoot people that way. And this game also... Adds, I think, I don't think this was in the previous ones, a pretty rudimentary cover system where you can mm-hmm. you can just kind of snap to cover. Um, you can you can it, yeah. it's not. I don't think it's a game meant to be played from cover, but it is a design change from the previous ones, where before you were really just running through and shooting guys before they shot you, and in this one you do have to do a little more ducking and popping up and stuff i think this first level max Payne 3 kind of shows its hand with what may be pretty frustrating for a lot of players and that's the ways that <clears throat> like the story and the cutscenes and the production are all very expensive looking and shiny and look cool like the game's almost 10 years old and it still looks yeah. great uh the gameplay though uh is kind of rough it is kind of a pain in... Th- I'm playing on console, I don't know. Oh, yeah, saying. well, you you talk, because I have feelings on this, okay. but, but you go first. So, I'm playing on PS3, and from second one of gameplay, I was like, I forgot that this game is very clunky. It is hard to get it in and out of cover. The soft lock often likes to either not work or lock on to the wrong target, Um, It didn't tell me how to do a lot of things. I spent a lot of time pausing and looking up the controls to figure out how to do like the jump thing. And he like, he has a roll maneuver he can do, which is very helpful. I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, I I, I don't want to be a person that says that it feels like one thing was uh, a victim of the other or priorities were in the production as opposed to the gameplay. Uh, But almost instantly I was like this is hard to control and very hard to play and i'm maybe not having as much fun right now as i thought i was going to be having in these early moments which uh persisted through the first three chapters well so so it's interesting that you say that and you can say that because i will be the other voice here and and first i should say i've only ever played this on pc i've never played the Mm -hmm. console version i fucking love how this game feels i think it is so good and part of that might be the aiming expediency that i have with a mouse because Mm. that is this is a game with small targets and and not a lot of automatic weapons um which are usually Mm -hmm. things that games give you you know it's like Every game has assault rifles because it's easier to hold down a trigger than click it once. Like that's that's yeah. just kind of how it works. But with a mouse and and with just the amount of time that I've played, I I know how Max moves and I love how physical everything feels in this. Like mm-hmm. this is this is a game that simultaneously feels very weighty in terms of how slow characters are and how they fall which i think we can we'll we'll save for like another episode talking like the intricacies of this game's physics system but like goddamn they are impressive (laughs) um yeah but also life is very fragile in max pain 3 both for you and Mm -hmm. for everyone else like one one headshot on a unhelmeted enemy always kills them no matter what like if you you get a headshot they're down in one um and you also can't take many shots you're you're a pretty Mm -hmm. pretty fragile dude and all of the bullets are moving very fast it's not like a halo game where you can kind of see stuff coming and get out of the way unless you're in slow motion but usually you know it's a game where encounters last 
seconds at most where you Mm -hmm. see a dude off in the distance and either you get the first shot off on him and he goes down or he gets the first shot off on you and then you really have to scramble to kind of get back to where you're going and so coming back to max Payne 3 is now kind of like coming back to an old friend for me because (laughs) i i just like know it so well but it is Mm. there are very specific decisions about how this game feels i think and and it's one of the things that i kind of like about modern rockstar it's one of the things i like about red dead redemption 2 is how how things don't feel like that choice was made just because of how all other games feel you know that this was like no we're going for a specific vibe and so we're going to do this one and and in this i think that vibe is a man who is capable of great feats of skill but is also pretty clumsy about them <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> one of one of the things i love about like the shoot dodge which is when you you jump and it's slow motion and you shoot is that this game makes it really easy for you to just like jump into a wall and fall down and be completely mm-hmm. open like it's it mm-hmm. doesn't make it cool automatically for you you kind of have to like <laughs> make it cool by yourself and there are lots of situations where max just ends up lying on the ground and then you kind of yeah. have to like tell him to get up uh and it's just yeah. it's so it's so weird but like how many other games do you play that are primarily shooters where the character is like an old man lying on the ground for a lot of them. <laughs> Mostly just rock stars. Yeah, that's true. You got a lot of those. Uh, the issue I kept finding with the gameplay, at least on console, was it couldn't make up its mind on whether or not I should be behind cover, like I'm Nathan Drake or something, or I should be running around shooting in every sure. different direction like early Max Payne games. I I would enter a combat scenario and couldn't figure out, okay, is this the one where I hide or is this the one where I'm running and jumping and going in slow motion? And, you know, let's get back to the story a little bit to establish how we get here, but I think the biggest center of that is the soccer stadium mm-hmm. level where every gunfight I feel like I died on, and I was like, I don't know what the game that wants level's for me pretty right rough. Now. We were messaging about it before yeah. this started. It's that, yeah, that so, is that's a level where a lot of the design conflicts kind of rear their head at once. Yeah. So Max, after the uh, kidnapping of Fabiana Bronco, the wife of uh, what is his? What's the guy's name? They're all just the Broncos yeah. to me. <laughs> But basically, the wife of the the guy in charge has been kidnapped. So Max and Max and his buddy Raul Pas, I've got to look these names up. <laughs> I'm not gonna try to navigate this. So Fabiana Bronco gets kidnapped, and Max and Raul pa- Pasos. If I'm pronouncing, I mean Max. Wrong, Max pronounce it pronounces it about as whitely as he can. <laughs> so. Actually, I think at one point early in the game he calls him Pesos, which is. Yep. A little weird. Um, so basically, they're like, all right, well, the Broncos are just going to pay to have her release. They'll pay the ransom or whatever. You go, this all happens at a nightclub. She gets kidnapped. It's basically just a shooting gallery. That whole thing doesn't really advance the story much other than just kind of some character exposition about the Broncos. Though I will Ruol. say, when I think about Max Payne 3, like, that nightclub is kind of the level oh. I think of, just in terms it's, of... It is amazing. Like, to- it, it starts, your, so you're, you're in... Um, you know, you're you're just grumpy and you're kind of escorting them and you're in this <laughs> VIP lounge and then and then a bunch of, you know, dudes come and start kind of like shooting guns in the air. And as Max, you run, grab a dude, smash through a window that's kind of like ten feet above <laughs> a dance floor, and and then the game goes into slow motion, and as you are falling the ten feet or so to the ground you are just shooting like all the dudes on this dance floor and it is an incredible scene i mean like the level of kind of like color variety and music going Mm -hmm. on like it is it is a thumping club soundtrack and whatever like in terms of just (laughs) level construction making it feel good to run through and shoot guys in (laughs) this is a this is a pretty high peak for the game 
for sure, for sure. I think uh, of the three levels we played, that's the best yeah. one. Um, but narratively, it doesn't serve much no, other than you get just, to spend a little. He's grumpy. You spend like he doesn't like yeah. being there. He says uh, this place is like Baghdad with g strings. Classic line. <laughs> yeah, very good moment. The only thing it kind of serves is to show you that like the younger of the Broncos is a oh, very he's an like idiot. naive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like it doesn't really progress much in the story other than that so th- the point where the story kind of gets picked back up is a lot of what we were talking about earlier with the politics and the family from the very beginning of the game you start to see more of in this third level where fabiana is being held for ransom and you know in a lot of movies the ransom is like ah, how are we going to get the money to pay to get her back and we clearly see this family is wealthy beyond our understanding because he says okay it's fine we'll just give them the yeah. money it's no big deal and then it's this comically big bag duffel comically large duffel bag they carry full of just an absurd amount of money and this i think is where the story finally opens up where you understand that this like scrappy gang is not your primary antagonist there's a Mm -hmm. paramilitary group and the game starts to throw even more things on top of its story at you but it's unfortunate that it's in just this kind of miserable slog of a level that is such a pain in the ass to get the level starts so you're you're bringing this big ransom bag and you're in the middle of a soccer stadium like a huge you know like eighty thousand person stadium or whatever um and you're handing it off to this gang and right in the midst of your handoff a sniper starts shooting, you know, from from way up in the stands and shoots a bunch of the, like, gang that you're handing it off to and then shoots Max in uh, what he refers to as his second favorite drinking arm, which I think is a pretty good Great line. line. <laughs> Great line. Um, so and good. so the, the first, I don't know, 10 minutes of this level, maybe it's shorter than that, but it feels pretty long. Are you just kind of as Max just stumbling and kind of sliding off the walls, being shot in the arm and being really? It, it, this is kind of a video game cutscene thing where he gets shot a bunch, but he got shot in this cutscene yeah. and it like really fucks him up. So you yeah. are just just sliding along, and Passos is kind of in front of you and is shooting dudes, and eventually you get bandaged up, and so you can return then to your full shooting ability you know all all of your senses are returned to you you have a piece of cloth on the wound and you took some pills (laughs) yeah you're fine but then yeah the kind of interactions this starts throwing at you are these just incredibly deadly situations where where characters can kill you really quick and the rooms Mm -hmm. are pretty I would say they're very realistically shaped for a soccer stadium, which yeah. doesn't necessarily make them super fun to shoot in. <laughs> the The thing that kept frustrating me were the combat arenas where you were in the stands. It happens like three mm-hmm. or four times where you run out into the stands and it's trying to do these interesting things where you're juggling like enemies at different heights they're like way above you or down below you and it's like okay well you have to make sure you know what's going on all around you but there's no real cover and you can't just jump down an entire staircase and like slow mow them all and it just becomes a frustrating jump down the entire staircase (laughs) but it's not as effective as you Uh, would (laughs) okay yeah it, it becomes this frustrating exercise in trying to memorize where each enemy group is going to come from and kill them before they can kill you and it's just it's an interesting part of the game because it's adding layers onto a complex story but feels like it's doing comp it competent competently enough that i'm interested in figuring out who all these different players are in this stadium with me but it's bogged down by having to fight all these dudes that you know, it's just becoming an exercise in trial and error of, okay, I died that time. I need to make sure I look right first, kill that dude, then left because there's two dudes over here. And it's just and not also, fun at all. you've got this, – this level is incredibly broken up with cutscenes. You know, between almost every mm. fight, there are cutscenes that are not – really story crucial it's just kind of max and passos like talking about stuff um this level is uh about twice as long as the first two i i was recording Mm. them and so i have the actual timestamps, and it's like this level is 
close to you know 35 40 minutes while the other the first two were like 20 um and yeah it's a it's a real slog it's it's hard to get through Mm. and there are there are some great moments in it you know there's um there's a thing where you pick up a sniper rifle and and Passos is like all the way across the stadium and so you're making these shots from like a mile away and and the game hold on oh I hate that. Oh, you, that is my you least favorite part of the game. This is this is Dude, maybe another control issue. I'm gonna caveat a lot of this conversation with saying I think my PS3 controller is dying on me. Also, <laughs> um, for some reason, when I would aim while I was shooting, it kept bringing up the um, the weapon wheel. Hmm. So maybe my controller is just dying. But also, this I could not figure out if there was bullet drop if I needed to aim before mm. the enemies as they were going mm-hmm. towards Passos. Like, it took me maybe four or five times just to get through that section because I could not figure out, do I need to be super precise where I'm aiming on the body or do I need to be a little ahead of them? Should I be above them? I still never figured it right. out. I think it was just luck that so I got through this I think I'll, I'll, I'll revise my previous statement. There is a visually spectacular segment uh, where okay. you are, because it will do these kind of bullet time, like, following the bullets across the entire stadium and then it like you know hits the dude or whatever um there's a scene the very last scene you're kind of climbing up on the the lights of the stadium Mm -hmm. and so you're way above everything and then you slide down and kind of flip into this room and and shoot a guy and and unlike one of the things that I do just love about this whole game is, unlike Uncharted, where it seems like everything is super easy to pull off, the animation really sells that Max is not, like, a really <laughs> fit dude, and he's he's very good at killing, but whenever he does one of these kind of, like, action movie moves, it seems like it hurts a lot. Like, he doesn't enjoy crashing through a window, and it makes it Well, feel... you know he's like... <laughs> And he's half drunk when he's doing any. Yeah, well, and also you know? we we haven't talked about that. The health system yet in this game is you are literally like taking gulps of painkillers. Like your your health in yeah. the corner will show that you have five painkillers left, and then you, you take out a bottle, which is incredibly just cheesy and on the nose, but does fit, yeah. fit the well, general. Well, it, it is it, it is a holdover from the yes. first two games. Uh, but also maybe something that could have gone away. I uh, I feel like that becoming a trope in video games because people like that's something people remember from the Max Payne games is like maybe this is a leap here. But uh, part of the reason which this game, I will say, does a good job of offering other takes on addiction in games. But this game continuing the just pill munching health mm-hmm. stuff uh, continues a lot of, I think max Payne's place in video games trivializing substance abuse because that became like such a funny trope in those first two games that video games kind of ran with it later rockstar would adopt it where you like can drink alcohol and it uh, or you know what i'm saying like games have stat boosts based on you getting fucked yeah up. And, and whereas i think the the alcoholism in this game is taken very seriously the yeah. pills are not really and it's just a gameplay system yeah yeah, and that shit sucks to me. Um, it sucks when any game does it, honestly, and a lot of games do do it. And it just feels like this relic of Max Payne's past that uh, unfortunately had some bad influence on other games that didn't necessarily need to be here. Just give me a health pack or give me regenerating health. Sure. Like, I don't need... You have a good story with the addiction stuff, with the drinking. I don't need Max's quips in the middle of a level being like, I had to numb the pain with my little white friends. And, it's like, and all right, I get it. Boy, does this dude quip. Like, he, yeah. he, talks, he talks about as much as Nathan Drake, but when Nathan's like, hoo-hoo, glad this handhold was here, all of Max's <laughs> life, like... This is, you know, we were talking about tiresome in the beginning of the episode, but, like, Max has the same energy for almost every one of his lines, mm-hmm. and, like, boy, hearing him spit out another, like, I had just killed 50 people in the country's <laughs> most hallowed prayer ground when he's talking about, like, the soccer stadium or whatever, it's yeah. like, oh my 
God, like, <laughs> lighten up a little bit. <laughs> well, let's, maybe this will be, this can be the last thing we talk about today is what is, because we're, uh, we're kind of deep in the conversation at this point, but what is carried over from Max Payne 1 and 2 and Max Payne's inner monologue, his cheesy quips that he's ostensibly saying to just himself those are like staples of the first two games that i think i really appreciate because i really like just like there's i don't remember if it's something max says in max Payne 2 but one character says it where they're like it was raining in the city like all the angels in heaven had decided to piss at the same (laughs) time like i'm very nostalgic for that i think i think uh, some of them work really well like second favorite mm -hmm. drinking arm and then some are just kind of like it's been 30 seconds since since max said anything (laughs) we need to but the irony to kind of where I come down on the pill munching stuff that is, you know, a carryover for the first two games, and I'm largely pretty negative on that, is this game's take on Max's substance use, which I, which was a big tenet in the first two games. I think mainly just the pills. Mm-hmm. Like, it was kind of implied you're eating all these painkillers. Maybe Max has an issue with them. But this game kind of takes that that hook from the first two games and decides to explore it with Max's alcoholism. And it ends up being... Like I was talking about earlier, like, there's kind of two stories going on at the same time. There's, like, Max's whole deal, and then there's the Bronco right. story. This story is, I think, what makes Max Payne so interesting is this game deciding to look at this character and kind of what we know about him from the earlier games and then kind of crack it open and see where they can take him, you know, 10 years later. Like, this isn't just a PS2 pulp shooter anymore. This is a big, prestigious rock star AAA game, and it's very gritty and serious and for adults. And it's like, where do we take this character? And where they landed on was, like, this really interesting exploration of not only addiction but like self-imposed recovery like max doesn't go to fucking the betty ford clinic Mm -hmm. or whatever that shit's called like he's just and we'll get into it later in the game but max does get sober for the most part um and this game the first three chapters where we played show alcoholism in a way that is very depressing and also at least in my experience it's realistic Mm -hmm. like this game isn't interested in being like oh max got drunk and he got behind the wheel of a car and killed a kindergarten class it's like no this dude goes home and drinks alone and cries and that's what a lot of us do or did Mm -hmm. you know Like, we didn't go party or any of the shit. It's why Max doesn't want to be at a club, despite there being all the alcohol around him. He just wants to be in his house or his apartment alone, away from everything, hiding from everyone. And this game, like, it's basically the first thing you see in this game is Max is like, I'm in Brazil now. And then the cutscene shows he brings a plastic bag home. He pulls out a bottle of whiskey and he gets fucking so drunk he can't stand he's throwing up everywhere also another throwing. another good line where he says he's got an apartment it's certainly it's certainly in new jersey <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um i i think the further we get into that because the story is going to dig into it more this is going to be the most interesting thing this game has to do narratively mm-hmm. but for you uh, a man who i do not believe is an addict uh what do you think about this take because it speaks to me directly, but it's also an interesting place for a game to go because we don't see this shit a lot in games. It is interesting because I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm glad to hear that it does speak to your experience because a little mm-hmm. of what I feel is we talked about how seriously this game takes itself and it yeah. does feel very, it, it's not heavy handed in the getting behind the wheel and you know running over someone but it it's certainly not subtle in any way shape or form about this um and it's not a it's not a subtle game so it doesn't have to be but i could picture a world where do you know someone who would experience this 
sees this game and they're like jesus i'm not like a monster like <laughs> you know that that max Payne is kind of a man made yeah. up out of <clears throat> grief and violence and booze and and so you know i sure I, I i could imagine someone being like this feels reductive but i am I, I'm glad to hear, although I want to give mm-hmm. you a hug, that, that, that it doesn't <laughs> feel, you know, th- that way to you and that it actually, you know, f- feels like it's, you know, yeah. actually speaking to, you know, what what that felt like. And the, But the, I will say, like, the other side of that is the frustration of the way this game makes a mechanic out of substances just because it's a Max Payne game, so he has to chew on pills mm-hmm. or whatever, and it's like... I mean, fucking, the, there's a million things you didn't carry over into Max Payne 3. Why do I need this? Why are you giving me such a good look and starting such an interesting conversation about addiction and recovery, but also being like, don't you remember in Max Payne 1 and 2, he chewed the pills and his health went also, up? I mean, I am not a guy who likes recovering health systems generally, but it feels like this game should yeah. just have auto recovering health like it just feels like that's how it should work and it's always kind of a surprise to me that like no you actually have like limited heals so okay so where where did this leave us going into next time i i feel like where we go next time is all the things we've established it's fitting that we talked about so much that's right because this game has so much and and it gives you all of it at once (laughs) and it will only continue so as the show goes on, I think we have to just stay on the same path and be like, here's how the combat evolved, or here's where the story is taking us. Here's, you know, these themes that started to sprinkle in the first three chapters. Here how the here's how he start to play out. Why is Max shaving his head? That's actually a really big thing based on the Dude, this game's got some good hair. I'll say that. He's got a good beard does, later yeah. on. <laughs> He's just got we do get to return to New Jersey, figure out why Max had to go to that's, Sao Paulo. That's the next next episode. I think it's honestly a really good tease because yeah. all the chapters just flow into each other. And so as I was shutting this down, getting ready for the podcast, I was like, oh, next level's in New Jersey. This will be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when I said this is Rockstar's most interesting game, I think there's a lot of good and bad with that. But we will... Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of things to talk about That's right. with this game. So before we before we close out, if you want to play along with us, obviously, as you've just heard over the past hour or so, we played the first three chapters. The next episode, episode two of five, we're going to play the next three chapters. Now, the play schedule will change up a little bit after that, I believe. But if you want to play along, play episodes or <laughs> play chapters four, five, and six. If you have any questions comments observations about the chapters you played or just the game in general you can tweet them at game underscore query on twitter or email us at gamequerypod at gmail.com uh we have a few but i'm gonna wait till later the next episode to start digging into all those because they feel like more overarching looks at the series but we do have some we'll start getting into so if you've written in so far listen to and uh, we'll just to just to make it easy for you chapter six is the chapter in the office uh so mm. stop playing when you reach the end of that chapter well jacob this is awesome i'm i'm really excited about this I, this is a game that i've wanted to talk about for a long time and i am glad that i found yeah. someone who is as enthusiastic about it as you yeah and we talked about all of it today everything (laughs) so i'm excited to keep going for anyone who wants to follow you hear your other work your other podcasts watch your videos all that good stuff um well my youtube is jacob geller uh just type that in my twitter is currently suspended because fuck that but hopefully by the time you're hearing it it won't be on Twitter, I'm also Jacob Geller or at Jakob G42. Uh, and if I'm still suspended, hashtag free Jacob Geller. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. And I've been your illustrious host, Blake Hester. Follow me on Twitter at Metallica is rad. Uh, maybe, just maybe, I'll have a rock star story, maybe two, coming out in the near future. 
So I, I'm always knee deep in Rockstar. I've decided it's just one of my beats at this point. So I'm glad this is uh, one of many in the catalog of my Rockstar library of stories. Uh, but yeah, thank you for listening to Something Rotten, the inaugural episode of our new Max Payne 3 retrospective. Write in with your questions, comments, concerns, observations, gamequerypod at gmail.com. Looking forward to the next one. Good night.